So Kurt and Charlie, I'm just gonna turn it over to you and we'll, you guys start the presentation. So have at it guys. And Kurt's gonna start it off. Kurt's an educator and that's, that's kind of why I recruited him because I'm not. So, I mean, I am in my own way, but, but he's, he does this. So th this would be very informative for everybody. Go for Kurt. Well, thank you, Charlie. And just so you know, um, I've taught many art classes at uh, Huntington Beach Art Center. I started in 2009 and uh, uh, taught for many years. Uh, took a little hiatus for a while while I was uh, moving and uh, getting some stuff done in my own personal career and then have come back um, and just happened to come back right now uh, during this COVID situation. So all my classes are online. So the, what I'd like to uh, present to you now is um, I'm going to present a video that <clears throat> Sachi Art created um, for its uh, online gallery. And it's very, um, very good in terms of explaining in a simple way what we need to do to uh, photo document our artwork. So let's, uh, let's wrap our minds around uh, kind of what they were talking about here. So let me jump into my um, PowerPoint presentation. So first thing we wanna do is in the video, he talked about using natural light, which is great because natural light is free. Um, but there's, you know, sometimes uh, circumstances where we don't always get the best even lighting uh, through just using natural uh, window light. Also, if we're photographing a piece of art that is um, going to be framed with glass or plexiglass, um, we also have to be careful about light reflecting off of that glass. So it's, it's one thing if you're just photographing uh, an oil painting or an acrylic or a watercolor where it's not, um, or any type of art where you're not really having to deal with uh, something, a surface like glass in front of the artwork. But if you are, are trying to um, do that, then a situation where we have kind of a studio environment where we have two lights set up on either side of the artwork. So the artwork would be placed on the wall. You'd have two lights of equal luminosity um, at the same height as the art. And you would have the, um, the same kind of lighting fixtures in each one of these lighting um, light uh, stands. So, because you want basically everything to be equal. And you, it's, it's very helpful to, as he mentioned, have your camera on a tripod, or if you don't have a tripod, some type of solid surface where you can stabilize your camera and make sure that it's parallel with the artwork that you're photographing. Um, so here's a schematic of how that would, how that works with the the lighting being equal in the same, in the, in the 45 degree angle to the artwork uh, at, at the same level as the artwork. You also wanna consider um, using a, um, a, a diffuse light. And I know that Charlie will talk a little bit later about how you can make your own uh, light uh, very cheaply from a, you know buying a clip-on lamp from Home Depot and um, making your own diffuser. So I'll let Charlie talk about that later. And then um, if you're going to be photographing your artwork, um, instead of hanging it on a, on a uh, surface like the wall, but you'd instead decide to um, you know, have your artwork set up on an easel, of course the easel will have um, a little bit of a diagonal shift. So you have to make sure that um, when you're photographing that artwork on the easel, that you have that same uh, shift angle, diagonal angle in your camera 
as the artwork has on the easel because you want to make sure that there's no distortion of angles. Uh, so it, it's, we basically want to make it as flat as possible. For those of you who um, might consider buying your own light equipment, uh, it's not as expensive as you may think. This uh, particular arrangement here, I just uh, scouted out on Amazon and it's like 19, $99.95, so a little under $100. If you're photographing three-dimensional artwork, it would be a very good idea to put your um, art, artwork, a sculpture, of whatever three-dimensional object you're photographing, to put that onto a sweep, um, a background. Um, but at this, this kind of setup where you have a roll of background paper coming over a table and the background paper is supported by stands, um, that's, that's kind of expensive. This is a little bit of a cheaper version of that. It, in fact, you could almost kind of do um, a, a tabletop setup by just buying a cheap uh, window shade and using that as your, um, as your sweep. Okay, so um, I'm going to talk a little bit about three-dimensional artwork uh, for those of you who do sculpture work in glass uh, or metal. Um, you know, you can, you can actually get a lot more dimension from photographing your three-dimensional piece by um, using a single light source because it creates more uh, shadow and contrast, so it gives it more of a three-dimensional look. Um, so here I'm basically using a portrait session because um, a portrait session involves a three-dimensional object, a person, obviously. And just, I'm just going to show you basically by just taking a single light source, which could be that kind of clip-on light that Charlie's going to talk about. Doesn't have to be an expensive light. Just by moving the light around, um, you can um, achieve different effects with that lighting. And in this situation, the light source is directly in line with the camera. So like if I held a lighting fixture directly over my camera and facing my subject, it would create what we call in photography flat lighting. So everything is evenly lit and um, there are no shadows. Um, and it's flat because it doesn't really create any sense of dimension. It's very complementary to uh, the subject, especially for a person, um, but it's not, it doesn't really give us a lot of feeling of three dimensions. So if we were now to take the light and move it to a 45 degree angle from the, um, from the, where the camera is and move it off to the side at a 45 degree angle, you can see now uh, that the um, subject is becoming more three-dimensional. And um, so this would be uh, 45 degrees off to the side and a little bit like 65 degrees high in terms of its, uh, it, its uh, position above the subject. And in this type of lighting, which is actually very nice, um, it's a lot of people call this Rembrandt lighting. Um, we, the lighting source on a human face actually creates uh, a triangle here on the uh, cheek. And that um, defines and creates more, uh, more of a sense of angularity and dimension. And this is, of course, used in a lot of portrait uh, lighting uh, situations and in fashion. So it's a very nice type of lighting to use. Um, this is uh, side lighting. And um, this is where the, now that we've moved the light source all the way to, to the side of the, uh, the, of the subject matter, which creates shadow, uh, shadowing effect, it almost splits the subject in half. It's sometimes referred to as hatchet lighting because it cuts the subject in half. Now, I would not necessarily recommend if you're photographing your three-dimensional subject um, with 
using this light on its own. What I might suggest doing if you decide to do side lighting is to, on the other side, on the shadow side of your object, of your subject, you maybe want to put a reflector, which would not be nothing more than just a, a cardboard, a piece of white cardboard or a, you know, poster board or a foam core. And that would um, take some of the light that you're, you've got on one side of your subject and it would reflect it into the shadow area so that it would open up the shadow and wouldn't make it so dramatically stark. Now, the worst kind of lighting is lighting that comes directly overhead, which causes these really dark uh, shadows under the eyes and the nose and the chin. So this is something you kind of want to avoid. Um, now, this is a situation where the light is coming up from underneath. And of course, we're all familiar with this in horror movies like Dracula and Frankenstein, where you know it gives um, the subject a ghoulish kind of scary look, a Halloween look. So again, not the best kind of lighting, but I'm just giving you some examples of how when you move the light around, take a look at what it's doing to your subject. What kind of effect is it having on the feeling of the art that you're photographing? Um, so like I mentioned using a reflector, and in this situation, this was photographed with one light, one light source, and the, um, the light was also uh, utilized with a piece of foam core. So in the schematic here, you can see how that illuminated the subject where one, the light was over here on the right, the light, the light bounced off of the, it illuminated the subject, but it also bounced off of the foam core, the white foam core, and then, and filled in the shadow area to give us more of an even lighting. So with just one light and a reflector card, you can do a, a lot of stuff. Um, in situations where you're photographing shiny um, objects, so some of you might be working with metal uh, that is highly reflective. Um, you don't, you definitely don't want to use any kind of lighting that is like a spot type of lighting because it would create hot spots. We call it hot spots on the reflective surface. So in a situation where you've got a highly reflective surface, like on this trumpet, what we want to do is use lighting that is diffuse. So here I'm going to show you the schematic. And again, the trumpet is on a uh, tabletop sweep and the lights are shining through diffusion screens. And um, the camera, is right there in the center between the two diffusion screens. If you're um, doing work with glass, that's another issue. Glass is very re reflective. Again, it's not a situation if you're shooting glass where you would want to have a spotlight. You would want, again, to be using more of a diffuse light. And so um, in this uh, uh, circumstance, the photographer set it up so that, again, the, those, uh, these wine glasses are set up on a tabletop um, a sweep, and the lights are actually hitting the, back, the background uh, paper of the sweep um, for the tabletop setting. So the lighting is not, not actually beaming in on the glass itself. It's reflecting, reflecting off of the background paper, and the light is coming through the glass to give us this amazing photograph, um, which is, is actually um, kind of common sense that it would work this way. But of course, if you're new to lighting, you know, it, it seems a little bit more like complex, but it's really not. And then if you're, uh, you know, again, most people are not necessarily highly invested in big camera equipment. So you could easily photograph your artwork using a nice uh, point and shoot camera. Uh, the lot of point and shoot cameras now today have very good quality and 
um, relatively good megapixels. Um, and so you can actually do a fairly decent job with just a, a pretty standard point and shoot type camera or even using your iPhone. Um, and I'm sure Charlie will go into a little bit of uh, using your iPhone uh, for doing this, but point and shoots are not bad. Um, of course, then you've got the prosumer cameras and um, you know, the, the, the very more professional DSLR cameras. Uh, of course, the benefit of having a more sophisticated piece of equipment like a DSLR, a digital single lens reflex camera, is that they can do a lot more for you in terms of the, um, what you can do in terms of photographing with that camera. Um, the, the point and shoots have a fixed lens. They have one lens that's, you know, built into the camera and the same with the prosumer camera models. But the DSLR cameras have lenses that you can uh, buy that, so you can interchange lenses you can put on um, a short lens or a standard lens or a zoom lens or a telephoto lens or a macro lens. So there's like a whole, it's basically like a whole system that you're utilizing when you get a DSLR. Okay, so one of the good things about using something like a DSLR, they mentioned this on the Saatchi video that the best, um, the best aperture to photograph your artwork with is to uh, uh, aperture F8. Okay, so apertures in photography are designated as uh, numbers with the letter F in front of it. And um, the best, they're basically saying your, your best uh, point of focus or best focusing capabilities usually come with your aperture at F8. This is the back of a, a DSLR camera. Now this also you can find on um, you know, light up a lot of point and shoots as well, but it's just basically your menu on the back of your camera. And what you want to do is when you're setting your menu up on your either your DSLR or your point and shoot is you want to make sure that your image quality is set for the best image quality. So in this camera, which happens to be a Nikon, they designate that as fine. Um, and then you also want to make sure that it's a JPEG, okay? There are some cameras, DSLR cameras, that have a designation for raw files. Um, raw files are very, that's the highest quality that you could photograph in, but it requires a lot of software and processing of that file. And it's very, it's pretty complicated. It's something you need to, you know, basically take a class to understand how to photograph and process raw files. So basically for what you're doing, you just want to basically shoot very good quality JPEG images. It's something that everybody accepts JPEGs. Um, and uh, if you shoot it in good quality, high resolution, you should have no problem um, submitting that to um, shows and galleries and online circumstances. And then um, you want your image size to be large. Okay, white balance. So if we go further into this function, there is, um, these are the options. There's auto white balance, there's incandescent light, lighting, uh, there's fluorescent lighting, direct sunlight, flash, cloudy, shade. These, these are different lighting scenarios that you can set your white balance to. Generally, automatic white balance works pretty well. And again, even if you're using auto white balance, it would be preferable to remember to maintain consistency in the type of lighting that you're using. So, you know, if you're using window light, just use window light. Don't mix it up with your other type of lighting. Okay, um, your ISO. Um, I think most cameras, today shoot relatively well in a 400 ISO. Now, ISO is basically your camera's, your sensor's sensitivity to the light. And um, 
a lot of people uh, say that, you know, well, you know, like I think on the uh, Saatchi video, they said 200 ISO. I really think 400 is fine. 400 is a little more sensitive. You really don't want to go too much further beyond 400 because the more sensitive you make your sensor to the light, the more you run into the risk of getting pixelation and distortion. So 400 is a really good place. I also think that since many of you are probably going to buy some of these uh, clip-on lights, that these hood lamps that uh, Charlie will be talking about, um, you do want a little more sensitivity in your sensor. So 400 is a good, a good uh, level of sensitivity to set your um, ISO to. <clears throat> okay, so that's uh, basically the 400. But you know, if you feel like you have enough <laughs> light and you want to set it down to 200 or whatever, you can do that as well. Um, again, this is just basically showing you how what I showed you previously was the um, monitor on my DSLR. Now this is my um, monitor on my um, point and shoot. So, you know, don't think that just because you have a point and shoot that you can't do some of these same things. So it's really important when you're um, photographing with either type of camera that you kind of browse through your uh, manual to get a sense of what your camera can do. Because I think you, many people would be surprised at what you can do uh, even with a point and shoot camera. So here, you know, my point and shoot, I can set my ISO even on my point and shoot, which is really wonderful. Um, and then of course there's color modes, which you have both on your DSLR and your, um, and your point and shoots. Again, this is on the back of my point and shoot. What you really want when you're photographing your artwork is to have your, um, your color mode set for standard or natural. You don't want to shoot something uh, when you're just doing a document of your artwork. You don't want to be shooting in vivid uh, or anything like that because sometimes that amps up the color too much and makes it unnatural. So you basically want to be uh, in the color mode of your camera that's shooting at the most natural, authentic, look that you have because you really want to show your artwork authentically as it appears, as it would appear to a person seeing it in the gallery. This is just a sample here of what, again, what some lighting, what a difference lighting can make. Uh, so on our top um, example, the light is coming in from the side and it's actually creating or emphasizing texture so we've got this beautiful flower sitting in front of a stucco wall. And on the top image, we have the light coming in from the side, which is emphasizing the texture that's within the stucco on the wall. But on the bottom, it's the same, the same plant in front of the same wall, but if we use flat lighting, which is the light coming directly from the camera source directly onto the subject, it, it basically eradicates all that sense of texture, making it very flat and, and not very three-dimensional. So um, again, if you're just photographing a two-dimensional piece of art, flat lighting would be fine. But if you're doing something three-dimensional, you would probably want to try to emphasize some of the texture in your art piece. Here's another example of a three-dimensional object. It's a, just basically a door handle, but the light coming in is coming in from a window from the side, and it's emphasizing the texture that's on the wood and on the paint and on the doorknob. So you can see all that beautiful texture and the tones uh, that are within this old door all the way by the down to where the key hole is, you can just see all that lovely texture, that would not be showing up as nicely if you were using flat lighting. So imagine this doorknob is your three-dimensional work of art. You can see how by using the, a good type of sense of lighting and having a sense of what you're doing with your lighting could really change the, um, the effect 
that it has on representing your work. Okay, so um, I'm basically, I think at the end of my, yeah, the end of my presentation here. So I can, I can chat a little bit about, uh, see, you know, it's funny, Kurt, you started out with lighting and you ended up with lighting because that's it. I mean, it's all it, about the light, Charlie. It's all about it. We all know that. All right. All right. So anyway, but you can also soften this light up. Let's just say, you know, I'm I'm using this for a, you know, for something on my ugly skin. Now, Charlie, this is the light you you got from. Yeah, this Home is Depot. a seven dollar seven dollar thing at, at Home Depot or Lowe's or any of that. You can soften it up with a with a piece of a rag, uh, a little piece of. Uh, uh, t-shirt or anything else. Now, white balance, getting back to that. This is really important. Get yourself some daylight bulbs. If you want to use these kind of elements here, the Kelvin of the daylight bulb would be anywhere from uh, 5,000 to 5,500, maybe 6,000, something like that, but it will mimic daylight. So you could be in your living room with daylight shining in, with no other no other lights, and use these things with uh, with with your daylight bulbs, just to to get and and actually now listen, stand them off too, get them away, get them farther away to diffuse it even more. See, so it's just it's pretty basic, and it took me a long time to figure lights out, and I still haven't got it down completely, but but gee, it's re it really is pretty easy. It's just just figure it out, man. You know, but the, the Kelvin thing, the, the white balance thing is super important, especially for artists. If you want to duplicate your colors and get your colors right without going and going through a whole bunch of software hoops, you have to nail this in camera. And if you don't, you're, you're, you're hurting. You ain't, you're not going to get it. It's not going to happen. And I do a lot of printing now lately. And boy, I mean, it's, it's a black hole. It's an absolute black hole to try to get these things absolutely correct. And in fact, I'm to the point now to where I get it, I get it where it's close. I say, that's it. That's, that's all I need, you know. But if you're really crazy, then you really have to get into it. Um, one other thing about, about the aperture thing, um, when they say F8, uh, I, I kind of I, I pretty much agree with that, but really, if you're if you're messing with a with a DSLR, um, you might want to check out which lens you're using and where the sweet spot of that lens is. Most lenses have a sweet spot, which is the best best f f stop to be shooting at for that particular lens. Kurt, yeah, I, I think you definitely um, have to just make sure that the light you use is consistent throughout. So yeah, if you're using right. daylight, then use daylight if you're using, but don't mix it up. Don't mix up room light with window light. It's completely different and uh, it's going to confuse your camera. Even if you're in auto, mm -hmm. it'll, you're not going to get the correct color rendition. So make sure that whatever you're doing, it's consistent throughout. I have a question. Yes, sir, Dan. When you're using the lamps from Lowell's or wherever it is, do you attach them to a tripod or? or well, if you just take it like your dining room chair, you could just clamp the light onto the back of your oh, yeah, two yeah, dining. Yeah, right. You could use two dining room yeah. chairs. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. So check this out too. Can you see this? So this is another one of these lamps that I have set up, mm -hmm. but I have it set on. Let's turn it off for a minute. Can you see the tripod? Oh yeah. Tripod mm -hmm. and also for you guys who want to use your iPhones or whatever, get one of these things. This is a little apparatus. You can move it around and get it where it's supposed to be. And I, it, this is a camera. This is not a phone right now. This is a, this is a damn camera. And these things are good. Another thing I think is very important, and it it shows up in some of the some of the art that we've seen in the virtual exhibition where the person just didn't get the thing parallel. And let's, let's define that term a little bit. Not so much parallel as planing in, in the same plane as the artwork that you're shooting. 
So if it's the wall, it's got to be in the same plane as the wall. Otherwise, you're going to get cocked one side or the other, one side of the piece, if it's a square piece or a rectangular piece, one side's going to be slightly smaller than the other side, or the bottom might be a little smaller than the top, and you're just in a world of hurt trying to get that fixed. It's hard. And it's hard for me. And I got this three-way three -way, uh, head in, 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 my, in my studio room to, to get this, to dial these things in and get, the, get it absolutely flat and parallel to the wall. And I'm always having to adjust that. I do want to mention one other thing about when you're documenting your artwork, if it happens to be framed with glass or plexi. Mm -hmm. Again, if you're photographing in a st studio type environment, you've got the lights both, both off to the side at 45 degree angle, but make sure that when you're standing in front of that glass that you are standing against a dark background and you're wearing a black shirt because you will reflect in the glass because of the ambient light that's in the room it will actually uh you could actually see a ghost reflection of yourself in the glass so make sure you're standing like what i used to do uh when i was do documenting people's artwork was i'd actually set up a black um like a piece of black fabric and i'd have a hole through the fabric and i'd have my lens sticking through the hole yeah, that so that sense. no reflection would come into the glass. Yep. That's an interesting concept because, because when we're talking about um, uh, reflections and things like that, I use, now I don't use glass, although I do like to sandwich my, my work, okay, so I use what's called non-glare plexiglass. It's called, it's the, the nomenclature is P99. It's not cheap, but it's not that expensive either. I buy a, I buy a four by eight sheet uh, for I think $180, $180. Okay, so you parse that down into, into the size of the pieces that you have and, and uh, you know, you, you can get a lot out of a sheet if you buy a sheet, but you know, I, most of you are not gonna buy a sheet and haul it home and start cutting it up. You need to have it cut for you. Um, I can do that. Can do that. Uh, what's your opinion of not using glass, but just using a coating? Well, I, I think I'd, I'd have to look and see what this uh, product that uh, Charles is talking about, I've never heard of it, but I'd like to investigate it myself. And, and you know, I've been printing a lot of my photos on fabric. So I think it would be really cool to see what this um, this chemical uh, could do with, uh, you know, printing. But I, I have my reservations about doing it on paper. I think anything that's on paper really should be under glass, whether it's glass or plexiglass. I think mm -hmm. paper is a completely different issue. Yeah, I do both though. And, and the paper I'm using lately, uh, it has a texture to it. It's a Red River product. Uh, it's called canvas, uh, paper canvas. And it's really, really nice texture. Uh, and kind of, I'm kind of, it kind of pisses me off when I got to put it under plexiglass, but I, I stick it on there anyway because I really like that stuff. I but, just would uh, be careful because a lot of the shows that I send my work to throughout the United States would never accept something like that if it wasn't under glass. If it was, if it was a print on paper, right. uh, they would they would demand that it would be under glass. Well. All right, you guys, thank you. Thank, thank you. Them. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kurt Good and meeting. Charlie, for thank all you. your work. Thank you. The wealth of information. Rock yes. on. Thanks.